Hello, my name is David Paletta, and I'm the senior leader at Mission Community Church. Before you begin watching the Sermon of the Week, allow me to pray that you might encounter God right there where you are. Father, I ask that your spirit will be present right where people are watching this video. May they be receptive to the voice of your spirit as they watch in Jesus' name, amen. From all of us at MCC, May God bless you as you watch this week's message.
premature man going on a journey beyond sight and sound. He's entered the demilitarized zone. Good morning, Vietnam! Ah! I feel good. Time to rocket from the Delta to the DMZ. Good morning, MCC. Happy Father's Day. I am really excited to be here and to share uh, my life and the experiences that I've had and, and the scriptures of the Lord. Um, I'm humbled by what David had to say. I'd like to connect for you the video or the, yeah, the video that you just saw. It's from a movie that came out in uh, 1988 called Good Morning Vietnam. Uh, starring Robert, uh, Robert, Robin Williams. Um, think about where we are today. Uh, I, 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 let, let me tell you the background. I had this thought running through my head um, the week before today, and I didn't, it didn't make sense. I said, Lord, why, why am I thinking about a crazy movie from, from the 80s? And, and so I didn't know. But I kept recurring. So Friday morning, as I was waking up, I really sensed the Lord say to me, I want you to see the connect from that movie and where you are today. Okay? He said, just as Vietnam was a real, was a real thing from 1965 to, I'm sorry, 1955 to 1975, was the war was going on. It had various responses from our people. I won't go into that. But he said, you are in a spiritual war now, each of you. You're in the midst of a guerrilla warfare that is going on for your life and for the life of your family. Now, we won't go into it today, but the United States of America is in a, is in a dark place. Be aware that our battle is up here. Our battle is in the spiritual realm where these forces are trying to take us out or nullify our effect. Uh, I think it's important for, I, won't, I can't go into it, but this morning when I got up, as I normally do, had a cup of coffee, whatever, I got sick. I had a pain in my stomach. I started getting shaky all over and I felt like I was catching the flu. And I thought, Lord, not now. I'm supposed to speak this morning. And, and so as I thought about that, I began to realize this is not a regular sickness. And so I began to stand and rebuke any kind of spiritual forces that were coming against me. And as I did that, I had the sense, you need to text your community group. And I want to mention that to you. We at MCC have what we call community groups. They're home groups. They are the people that we do life with. Now, we, we get to visit with all of you all on Sunday, and it's a blessing. But the ones we do life with are our community group, like families. So I, uh, I texted some of them, and I said, just, I said, don't call me. Just pray for me, because I really didn't want to talk. And, uh, and they began to pray. Fifteen to twenty minutes later, it lifted. And I felt just like I do right now. So God is awesome. Uh, as I get into the message, uh, there are two core principles that I want you to consider. Many of you have heard these, me say these before. Uh, the two core principles are life is relationships. If you have a good life, I'll guarantee you it's because you have good relationships. It's the core of our lives. Uh, think about where you're sitting right now. I, my, many of my family are here today. Uh, we live life together. We share the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, the other core principle is something that Ken Helzer told us about back in the fall. And I want you to look at that. He was quoting Peter Gregg. And these are the words he said, learning to hear God's voice, his word and his whisper is the single most important thing you will ever do. Now, they're important things that all of us have to do. 
But I want you to know that in my life, that is true. I was, um, by way of introduction, I was uh, raised Southern Baptist. Hang on a second, let me get my note. Uh, Richmond, Virginia. I went to Virginia Tech, studied mechanical engineering, I moved to Charlotte. I married my high school sweetheart. I moved to Charlotte in 1965. We had three children. Uh, I failed to tell you that I was, as I was raised Southern Baptist, I believe that Jesus was, had died for me. So if you'd stopped me any time on the street from when I was 12 till I was 30, I would have said, uh, yeah, I believe Jesus died for me. But I didn't have a clue of what that meant to my life. It, it just wasn't a connect. And I know many of you here have had similar experiences. You got to know theoretically what Christianity was, but you didn't have the relationship or the experience. And so when that happened to me, it was 1972, and I had a dramatic encounter with God Almighty, and it literally changed my life. There's so many stories I could tell you about that. I also led a home group for 40 years, and some of my dear friends from that era are here today. They're not members of our church, but they loved me, and they wanted to be here uh, when I shared, and I'm so thankful. Um, and then I came to MCC at the end of 2019, just before COVID hit. And uh, then we, like many churches, had to, had to split up from the standpoint of not being able to assemble as a big group. And so that's when I became familiar with what we now call the community groups. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, if you are a member here, please consider my advice. Community groups are where you receive life. If you're not a member, Pray, ask the Lord, and seek one out. Call Tessa, our administrator, and she'll get you hooked up. I joined this community group. I was asked to lead one. And my particular area that the Lord, that the Lord seems to be doing and that the pastor and the elders have suggested is that I be involved in counseling and deliverance. Uh, counseling is probably familiar with most of you. Many of you aren't familiar with deliverance. But if you have problems that you can't deal with in your life, call Tessa. Now, I'm, I'm asking you to do this. Call Tessa and get my phone number and call me. The last thing I wanted to say in this introduction is that April a year ago, I had some pain in my side, so I went to the hospital and I was diagnosed with fourth stage pancreatic cancer. Most of you know that pancreatic cancer doesn't mess around. It, I have two friends that died within three months. When I was told this, I can't explain what happened. I mean, it's like I knocked the breath out of me. My family actually reacted more than I did. My three children said, Pop, you got your will done. You know, you know is everything in order? <clears throat> but I told them now, and I'm telling you this morning, I don't think it's my time. And at the end of my message, I'm going to demonstrate that to you. But right now, just let me leave it right there. If you could put up the first scripture. Well, not a scripture. It's a, it's a quote. There you go. My friend Derek Prince quoted, said this, and I wanted to read it to you this morning because it's so much connected with what I want to share. 
In view of the fatherless generations all around us, we recognize that no one is ever going to be satisfied until they have a father. David Sanford alluded to that this morning. Who loves them? The father loves them. There is a father who is waiting for them, who will not condemn them, who will not criticize them, who will not point out all their faults and failings. He's just waiting. I believe if we could get that message across to the fatherless generations all around us, many of them would run into the father's arms. That is what they're longing for. So part, part of your assignment and mine, in, in your own way, not in a cookie cutter way, share the love of the father. I hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate that to you as we go on. Uh, I'd also like to pull up a scripture, John 14. If you don't mind, I'll read it. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Please let that echo in your spirit. No one can get to the Father who is the creator of everything without coming through Jesus Christ. Life is in the Father, it's in the Trinity. Jesus goes on. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You know, the, <laughs> All of these scriptures you could, te you could teach a lesson on, but, but I want you to realize that in John 17, which is Jesus' high priestly prayer, he talks about the unity of the church. Father is mentioned many times in John 17, and it is such a, uh, as you read it with that view, looking for the name Father and what it means, John 17 is a precious, precious scripture. I would like to also have you read with me or look at it, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family, and then in parentheses I put, from whom all fatherhood, earthly and heavenly, derives its name, in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you and me, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might, through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints to know the love of Christ, which, is, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And you'll see a little note I made at the bottom. That last phrase can only be known supernaturally. It's not a cognitive thing. You can learn about what the Bible says about the Lord. You can learn about what the Bible says about Jesus and the Father and Holy Spirit. But you cannot know the knowledge that, that Paul is talking about here unless the Father reveals it to you. It's a supernatural knowledge. Now, when we talk to the world, our friends, whatever, who don't know the Lord, that doesn't make any sense to them. It's, it's like, phew, goes right over their heads. But it's true. So, um, you can go to the next one. So, my introduction to the core of my message, which is those three points. Uh, I said, Lord, you, you've got me talking about fatherhood. How do I boil that down into something that's not only understandable, but rememberable? people can remember. Um, the Father is talked about in the Old Testament, but particularly in the New Testament, because Jesus introduced the fact that God is a Father, and the only way to get to Him is through Him. So let me first of all read these three points. You've got them in front of you. Every father, good or bad, is called to be a priest, a prophet, and a king. As priest, 
he presents his family to the Lord. As a prophet, he hears from the Lord or from the scriptures, and he shares that with his family. He's the, the actual go-between. And as a king, he sets up the parameters, the rules in which the family is going to live by. He's not a despot or, a, or a, a control freak. He's just the man that God holds responsible for his family. And so he, hits, he sits, sets the rules. And I'm going to share with you some testimonies from my own life about these. Uh, and before I even get into the testimonies, you all know that I'm imperfect. Most of us are. So when I tell you these stories, which illustrate the goodness of God, don't look at me like I'm a super father or have done everything right. I've done so many things wrong, like most of you. That's not the point. The point is how the father responds to a godly man when he comes to him, when he fulfills his role. So let me, let me connect. I have to thank my, my grandson, William, for this. Let me connect the scriptures to those three things. In Hebrews, I can see it. And he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then in Acts, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. He you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And then Psalm 2, ask of me, I have set my king on Zion's hill, my holy hill. So there we, and I could go on and on, but there we have the priest role, the prophet role, and the king role of King Jesus that we all understand. So let's look at the priest. I already read the Hebrew scripture. Thank you. Uh, I have three children. I have 10 grandchildren. And so far, I have five great-grandchildren. God has blessed me with a family. Thank you. Thank you. But in order to illustrate the priest, the prophet, and the king, I want to tell you three stories. My oldest son, after he had his children, was involved in what I'll call an egregious sin that shook his family, it shook me, it shook all of our family. And I was so mad and angry that it was hard for me to even talk. Uh, the first few times I had a chance to, to meet with him or to talk with him, all I could say is, is angry things, condemnation. And then one day I was praying, I actually was crying. And the Lord asked me this question. He said, Bill, always calls me Bill. He's, I'm Bill. <clears throat> he said, Bill, how do I treat you when you sin? Now, I want you to get my answer because many of you all would give a similar answer. I said, Lord, you forgive me and love me when I repent. And he said very calmly, Bill, is it just when you repent that I love you? He connected with my heart in a way that I just, I can't explain. It was powerful, palpable. And so I called my son. I asked him to meet me at Starbucks to talk with me. <laughs> and he was a little leery to get together, to say the least. But when we met, we sat down at Starbucks, and you could, you could cut the tension with a knife. And I said to him, because you could see all the tensing, and so I said to him, Wes, I want you to know something. There's nothing that you could ever do that could cause me not to love you. And as I said those words, tears began to trickle down his face. And God began to turn his heart. Today, he's a godly man. 
in his family. He has three precious children, grandchildren, attends church regularly, and is a part of the body of Christ. One other word I just want to say, uh, you wives, and in some cases husbands, but you, you have to face some horrible things. And when you made that covenant vow, excuse me, I have, I have neuropathy and I can't, my fingers don't work. But, but I need a drink. <laughs> they are inside things that jokes convey. Uh, but his wife, uh, her name is Bunny, is a special woman of God. She believed in the midst of the pain and the, and the hurt that she made a covenant vow. And she was not backing down. Wow. We need more women like that. We really do. Young women, old women, God is in control. And if you're his, he will take care of whatever you run into. So the second story has to do with that of being a prophet. Now, I use my story to let you know that I, during that time, I was taking my family and myself to the Lord. I was saying, God, you have an answer. I know you do. I don't understand, and I'm hurting. But Lord, I'm bringing my family to your throne. I didn't realize, I want you to know, I didn't realize the role I was playing at that time. I was just a dad trying to hang in there. But God was using me in his ordained office of priest of my family. Do you see that? Okay, prophet. Prophet is where we bring what the Lord shows us to our children. And I want to tell you, and I'm going to use my youngest son, Charlie, to illustrate this. Many times when you share something with your children, you're really not plan you you're really not you don't think you're prepared for it. You get this question or this situation and you think, oh my Lord, how am I going to respond to this one? I mean, because we don't know. So Charlie went to college in uh, California and thank God he met a beautiful young woman there named Michelle, and they became husband and wife later. But before he was married, he had graduated college and he lived in Denver with three other guys. And you can imagine what a house with three, four guys is. Anyhow, they were all trying to get started in careers, jobs, and so on. And so one day, Charlie knew that I pray in the morning, that I have a devotional time. So he, he called me, and you, his voice was shaking. And he said, Dad, I don't know what to do. I've got this job. I really don't like it. And I have tried to hear from God. And I can't hear him. You always say you hear from God. What do I do? Can you imagine all of a sudden I got this load? What do you do? Lord, I don't want to give him my, my thoughts. I want him to give him your thoughts. And so I think wisely, I said, Charlie, I want you to kneel down or, or whatever. They're in, in Aurora. And, and pray and ask God to speak to you. And then, son, just wait. Wait for him to respond to your prayer. He kind of, okay, you know, kind of gave it, all right, I'll give it a shot. So the minute I hung up, I got down on my knees, and I just began to cry out. Lord, my son needs you. I can't do it for him anymore. He's got to do it on his own. About 15, 20 minutes went by. The phone rang again. It was him. His voice was completely different. He said, that's amazing. He said, he said, that is amazing. He said, Dad, I heard him. God is so faithful. 
even when we don't have the answer. The other story is still about Charlie. When he was a teenager, he was really a good soccer player. The good thing about him is he could shoot with either foot. So he was a left wing, but it didn't matter. He could shoot from anywhere in the field. Uh, one day he was playing uh, a rival team. He went to Providence Day. And some kid, because he used to go to Charlotte Christian, some kid had it in his heart to take him out. Now, I know David Sanford will know this, and many of you who are into soccer. You can tackle somebody, which means going after the ball. But if you're not going after the ball, it's a foul. This guy tackled Charlie from behind. Apparently, he did hit the ball slightly, but he hit mainly his leg. And so Charlie hyperextended his knee and was really, was really hurt. We didn't know how bad. My wife told me, I have, at that time I was working from the office and from home. I happened to be home. And um, I was there, and he came in on crutches. You could hear him coming up the steps, his room on the second floor. And he came in, and he said, man, I have really screwed up my knee. And I said, well, uh, come sit down. I said, uh, do you mind if I pray for you? Well, we prayed in our family. I prayed at night. One of my father roles was to put my hands on my children from the time they were born until they left home and pray God's blessing on them. Uh, so Charlie was used to prayer. And I said, Let, may I pray for you? And he said, yes, sir. And I said, may I uh, softly touch your knee? He said, yeah, but it really hurts. So I'm showing you the details to let you, and, and I, all I felt is I needed to do this, but I didn't, I didn't have the answer. So I put one hand under his knee and one on top, and I said, Lord, my son has hurt his leg, and I ask that you would heal him. Now, how many of you, you can just raise your hand if you would, how many of you have ever received a gift of faith? Not too many. Well, a gift of faith is the supernatural faith of God. It's not your faith. It's something that he downloads to you, and you know that you know that you know. You with me? So as I put my hands on my son, I knew he was going to be healed. I mean, it was like, did I hear a voice? No. I had an inner sense that he was going to be healed. And so I prayed that simple prayer, and I looked at him, and I said, stand up and give that a, give that a try. Well, he looked at me like, you've got to be crazy, Dad. I mean, you know, I really hurt. But he stood up. Then he started doing this. And then he started bouncing. He said, that is amazing. That's being a prophet. That, that's being a prophet to your family. Did I feel like a prophet? No way. I felt like a father trying to help. My third story is of my daughter. Uh, she went to the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Um, quick, quick story. I just feel like it's important that you hear this. Uh, we used to go to our home church at Charlotte Christian School. We met there. And we were coming out one day, and we'd already had church, coming out to our cars. And I put my arm around Susan, was tickling her, and she was going, kind of being giddy like that, and I was holding her close to me. And I had one of the brothers in the, in the church come up to me. He said, Bill, you got a minute? And I said, yeah, sure. He said, how do you do what you just did? I said, what? He said, how do you hold your daughter like that and have fun with her and hold her so closely? I said, well, we've always done that. She's my little girl. He said, a lot of people don't know that they can do that. The society has said some of that's taboo because of the weird things that evil men are doing. So there's just one, one lesson, but I have another story that's a little darker. When Susan was 20 years old, after her sophomore year, the summer she was 20, she began to act the way in a way that was not the way she'd been trained. Uh, she started to kind of be uh, strongly opinionated, uh, 
I mean, I know young people are opinion. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about pushing back. And she began to um, stay out late. I wasn't, many nights I wasn't awake when she came in. However, my wife was awake. And she said, wake up, Susan's not home. And I said, well, honey, what do you want me to do? A typical man. And she said, well, one thing I want you to do is not go back to sleep. So this particular summer, she was staying out later and later. One night she may have come in at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I was frustrated. She knew, I'll just use this gently, the rules. We don't do that in our house. But they weren't structured rules. They weren't, I didn't mention them. It was just known. And so I said to her uh, the following day, I said, honey, I want you to know something. You're, you're behaving in such a way that is not compatible with, with our family. God's not pleased with the way you're doing. And I also said, without, without any malice, I just said, matter of factly, if you can't live by my rules, you'd probably be better off someplace else. I didn't say, I'm kicking you out, anything like that. I just said, you'd probably be better off. Well, the weekend came, and as you already know, I pray on Saturday morning. So I got up to get ready to go to prayer, and I sensed this thought came to me, check on Susan, because she's normally asleep. So I went upstairs to her bedroom. She was gone. All her clothes were gone. She cleaned everything out. Gone. And so, obviously, I was uh, hurt, concerned, fearful. Guys, I didn't hear from her for two weeks. Not a word. She just vanished. My wife was beside myself. She wanted to call the sheriff, the police, the CIA, uh, Homeland Security. <laughs> so then, and we prayed, we prayed, and we prayed, and many a night we would go to bed, laying on our pillow, and our pillows would be wet behind us from crying. Not like boo-hoo-hoo, but just silently weeping. The, 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 the tears would flow out. So then, uh, uh, two weeks later, no, not two weeks later, I'm sorry, mixing up my story. So she, I said, uh, she called me and she said, hey, Dad, uh, the school hadn't gotten the money that you normally send them. I said, they're not going to. She said, what? I said, they're not going to, honey, you're on your own now, you're a big girl. You can see her getting desperate. So she said, well, how about my two, how about, uh, a room and board. I said, no, that's yours too. So she was really desperate, and she said, how about my books? I said, no, honey, you're, you're totally on your own. I love you. Uh, I pray that God will bless you, but you're on your own. And she hung up. She worked four and one time five jobs to put herself through school. She graduated with the best grades junior and senior year that she ever got. She basically wouldn't quit. She's, she, I've talked with her since she thought, I'm just not going to give up. And she proved that she could be a strong-willed, I already knew that, woman. And then she was two years, finished at Greensboro. She came home for Christmas, but it was tense. My wife didn't even want to talk with her. All during this time, I was in sales, and whenever I traveled through Greensboro, I would call Susan and ask her if she'd like to go to lunch or so. I never gave her money, but I did take her to lunch or dinner or wherever when I was there. So two years went by, and then another two years, she went to work with the Greensboro News. We only heard from her very rarely. And then one night she called, which shocked me, and she said, Dad, this is Sue. She said, is Mom there? And I said, yes, your mom's here. She said, would you ask her to get on the phone? I did. So Gwen and I were on the phone, and she said, I want to ask you all something. Can I come home? Uh, and I just kind of hung there for a minute, and I said, well, Sue, I, I love you, uh, 
but the rules haven't changed. It's still God's house, and, and you know, I expect people to live by the rules he gave me for us. And then she said these words, Dad, I understand now that my life will never be blessed until I get my heart right with you. That's fatherhood. But I wasn't trying to be super dad. I was just answering the phone. What I want you guys to see, young and old alike, even if you're not married, God wants to be your father in such a way that he will help you lead your family. It's what he does. It's who he is. He's a good, good father. Can you put the training slide up? I, wanna, I want you to see this because it has to do with all that I've been talking about, and it has to do with you, particularly as you're raising young children. You know, they say that the early years, whatever they are, five, six, seven years, are so critical in a child's life, boys or girls. You, you set standards in them that they may not be able to tell someone else on, but, but they know them. Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Guys, I can tell you this morning, that is true. Experientially in my life, it is true. My mentor was a name, man by the name of Jay Festerman, and there's a quote up there that he said to me. Training, by definition, to train someone is to so form or change their behavior that for them to deviate from the way they were trained requires that they make a conscious act of their will. If you think about that, what it's saying is they can, they can deviate. They don't have to do what you say, but they can't do it accidentally. I don't know about you all, but in a lot of families, certainly in mine, I heard I forgot a lot. And sometimes I said, I forgot a lot. But the thing I want you to see is that training is different than teaching. Teaching is giving someone information. You can even ask them to repeat the information. But training is changing their inner buy-in. Are they, are they going to, can they live that? And when you train a child, regardless of how old he is or how young she is, God will bless that. But you have to train, and by training, you have to model, and you have to follow up, and you have to ask questions, and it's an ongoing thing. Those of you who are parents, you know that. So train your children. One other quick story. I know I'm run over, sorry. Um, Gwen was talking to my youngest son, Charlie, and she was reprimanding him like, slightly. But she had her finger out. And she said, Charlie, listen to this. Patience is a virtue. Now repeat that to me. He said, uh, patience won't hurt you. And she said, close enough. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, coming in, you saw a table with this booklet on it, uh, Father God by Derek Prince. It's not a thick book. It's just a little one. But if you haven't picked one up, Pick one up when you leave. It is a treasure in just a few pages. Uh, I just ask you to do that. It, it'll, it'll bless you or someone you know. So the last thing I want to tell you is about my health. Many of you all are aware that I have been diagnosed with cancer. That was in April. I just told my oncologist three weeks ago, I said, listen, chemotherapy is designed to kill the fastest growing cells, right? And she said, yeah, in theory, that's right. I said, well, I'm going to take a break. She said, you are? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, okay. So I've stopped chemo, but she's offered me every two months to come back and take a picture. And I said, thank you. That's, that's a blessing. No more chemo. Now, I told you I was going to illustrate the faithfulness of God. Three, three months ago, or maybe longer than that, probably back 
the turn of the year, my youngest son said, Dad, we, we are all divers, scuba divers. I am, he is, his son is, Wes is, Wes's son is. There are five of us. He said, I'd like to put together a trip where we go to Grand Cayman and dive for a week. And I said, well, man, count me in. So we went. Uh, before the video, I got a short video. It's only 40 seconds long, so the first picture you're going to see are the five of us. And then you're going to see two short videos, and then you're gonna, I'm going to end it with a picture of me and my two grandsons. Here's what I want you to know. My time with my grandsons, I love my sons, and that was, we all had fun. But I wouldn't exchange the time I had with those two men, my grandsons, with anything. I had a chance to get to know them, more the younger one than the older one. I had a chance to get to know them as men. And we shared stories. We cried together. We laughed like crazy. But, but it was bro time. It was hanging out together. It's what Dave Yur calls community. And we were doing that, and it was awesome. That's me in the middle. They're scooters. And they kind of tow you along. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord. We praise the Lord. So the final comment that, that I want to suggest to you is that God is healing me. And it is because of your prayers that I stand here today, as far as I'm concerned, with no cancer. Now, that medical science is, hadn't caught up with us yet. So I'll continue to have the scans. Over the past 14 months, every time they take a picture, they see the sights in my abdomen. But one doctor said to me, Bill, you got all these huts in there, but there doesn't seem to be anybody home. So Lord, I just want to thank you for the word that you allowed me to share today. And I pray that you would touch the people who need prayer. Use, use your men, Lord, the ones that you've anointed to pray for these people. I pray in Jesus' name. Hey, thank you for watching the Sermon of the Week. We pray that you were blessed by it and you felt prompted to act upon what the Spirit of God was saying to you. If you live in the Charlotte area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at one of our weekend gatherings. That way you can find out more about our church family and what we value most. We encourage you also to give to our ministry so that we might continue spreading the gospel of Jesus to our city and throughout the world. To do so, you simply go to missioncommunity.cc, click on the Give button, and the rest is simple. Lastly, I would encourage you to check out the remaining content on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe. That way you will receive all of the reminders for fresh content that we put out. Have a wonderful rest of your day. May God bless you and thank you again for watching this week's message.